you see this, the sign is in the center now. So uh, another little triumph. All right, welcome to Grand Rounds. The weather's kind of crappy out there, but we need the rain. This is today's CME code. And remember, still put it in even though nothing happens. Uh, it does get credited, we're told, and they are working on it still. Okay, it's a little trivia question today. So today is the birthday of uh, Pavlov, who became famous for what's called classical conditioning, which is pairing a stimulus with an involuntary reaction. So famously, if any of you own dogs, you know, the second you throw out the food, they start salivating. So that is a, you know, that's just a response a dog does. It's not paired to anything. And then he paired it with the, the sound of a bell without the food and the dog would start salivating, okay? So we all know that. Operant conditioning is even more important. Operant conditioning is when you associate a behavior that's not tied hard to the stimulus with getting a reward. So a rat presses a lever, out comes some food, okay? So who first described operant conditioning? No volunteers? E.F. Skinner at Harvard. He was a behaviorist and he used as his uh, uh, model the pigeon. And he believed that all behavior was just uh, operant conditioning, that there was no free will, that the brain was just born as a, uh, you know, as an empty slate to be modeled by behaviorist techniques, which of course uh, was not correct, but a little bit correct. So Deborah Rose, won the Maddox Aspiring Investigator Award from the Duke Aging Center. So congrats to uh, Deborah. And she's in the cognitive aging space. When did space become a thing? That like you're in the education space or in the clinic, you know, the medical space. When I was your age, we didn't say space about anything. When did it become a space? which only means it's not going to be a space in 10 more years. And what will it be then? You need to be ahead of that curve. So in celebration of Women in Medicine Month, Sarah McNutt, uh, born around the time of the Civil War, was uh, the first American woman uh, neurologist to be inducted into the American Neurologic Society, which probably no longer exists. She published some of the earliest papers on spastic hemiplegia and cerebral palsy. Uh, coming events at Duke, Jody Fleischer, who's from Rush, who I do not know, uh, Hyde Floating Meeting Controls, is giving a, a lecture as part of the Trent, Trent Humanities series, October 4th, next Wednesday, on the power of the human connection, caregiving and chronic illness. And then Wayne and the Stroke Team are part of the American Heart Association Triangle Walk next October 8th, even email Wayne or, uh, or Will uh, to find out a little more details on that. Click. The Duke Comprehensive Epilepsy Center's next symposium is on October 10th, featuring Christopher Grova, who's from McGill University, and our second Slicer Dicer monthly meeting with Elijah and Pizza will be Wednesday, October 11th in the Massey Conference Room. That's where you learn how to use EPIC for research and quality. The research roundup, Birgit Frauscher and Alyssa Ho found that non-REM sleep does not affect ictal spatiotemporal dynamics, suggesting that once the brain surpasses the seizure threshold, it will follow it regardless of the vigilance state. In other words, being asleep does not stop a seizure, which is an interesting thought. And Jay Lusk and Emily O'Brien, no relation, as well as Kim Johnson and Margaret Getz, looked at uh, the, the EPIC, the electronic health record, and compared it to Medicare databases and found that uh, Medicare databases and the electronic medical record didn't have much agreement as far as what conditions patients had. Oh, Medicare right. turned out was more sensitive. Somebody's unmuted. I really miss not having the floating meeting controls because you know that shows you immediately who's talking as it zooms to them. So we're a little powerless here. Dylan Rhino is becoming famous for nominating people for the All-Star Award. And this week he nominates uh, Olivia Detweiler, 
for uh, taking care of a very sick MICU patient long after uh, her shift ended and uh, the kind of warm feeling everyone felt the next morning or the satisfaction of hard work well done. And Bert Scott, uh, nominated by Maggie Soltis, who was working at Regional, and Bert went above and beyond to touch base with the patient and family. It was one of his patients every day to adjust, adjust the medications, and Maggie was very grateful for that. So Bert, you've got a coffee cup coming. This week's edition of Did You Know? The uh, sex of the baby green sea, green sea turtle, which was an endangered species, is determined by incubation temperature. This is one of the benefits of global warming, it turns out. Currently, 90% of all baby sea green turtles are women because women are born if the temperature is higher. And this has led to a population explosion of uh, baby green uh, turtles. Their nests are all over Florida. And that's like the cutest little thing. Look at how many of them come out from one little nest. And 90% of them are women and they're gonna reproduce that, so to speak. Again, this is today's CME code. And our presenter today is the great Meg Sugita. Meg, take it away. So uh, let me, how do we get out of this? There we go. All right, good morning. Um, my name is Meg Sugita. I'm a third year neurology resident. Um, I'll be to doing today's case presentation. All right, so we have a 49-year-old male. Uh, he has a past medical history of hypertension. He also had a recent cholecystectomy two weeks ago and now presenting with progressive weakness and loss of sensation. He developed numbness and tingling from his bilateral feet up to his knees, and then it progressed to involve his arms and specifically his tongue's lips and throat. Yep. All right. um, he also reported some difficulties following both liquids and solids. He had trouble uh, buttoning up his shirt and also opening bottles. His social history was notable for chewing tobacco and he also worked as a construction worker but hasn't been able to um, because of some of these symptoms that began. He came to the ED with a pretty unremarkable workup. His CK was elevated at 473, but otherwise um, CBC, CMP was normal. Um, lumbar puncture was done um, and that was normal as well. The CT head showed no acute intracranial process. And then he also had an MRI total spine that was non-diagnostic. And so um, his neurologic exam, um, he didn't have any pattern of weakness, but he had some weakness in the proximal uh, upper extremities in his deltoids and his wrist extension flexion, fingers um, spread, but otherwise um, good grip strength. Um, he had some weakness in the hip flexors, knee flexion and extension, but again, good uh, distal lower extremity strength. Uh, for his sensation, he had pinprick that was dull from his finger, uh, fingertips up to the mid arm bilaterally, and then from the toes to the mid thigh on the left, but uh, below the knee, uh, from the toes to below the knee on the right. Um, he had lots of temperature sensation of both toes, um, impaired proprioception in the upper and lower extremities. Um, coordination was poor with finger to nose, and then reflexes were absent throughout. And so an EMG nerve conduction study was done. Um, this showed that all sensory nerve responses were absent and that he had no fibrillation or sharp waves and just the presence of some minor chronic uh, motor changes. So we diagnosed him with a sensory polyneuronopathy. Um, this is also known as a dorsal root ganglionopathy. It's a um, rare sensory polyneuropathy um, due to damages of the sensory neurons at the dorsal root ganglia or the trigeminal ganglia. Um, a hallmark feature of presentation is that patients can present with early onset ataxia and an asymmetric, non-length dependent generalized sensory deficits. 
And so in this person um, that was presented before, we talked about a little bit of some motor weakness. Um, and so sometimes they can appear weak. Uh, and this is secondary to some proprioceptive dysfunction. Um, as well. And the pathophysiology for um, a sensory neuronopathy is that um, nerve damage uh, can incite the Wallerian degeneration that leads to the chemical and structural disintegration of the nerve. Um, prognosis can depend on the nerve's ability to regenerate and remyelinate. Sometimes in segmental demyelination, the prognosis is positive and there's a quicker return, in, um, especially in pain and temperature. So once we diagnose a patient with um, a sensory poly, uh, neuronopathy, uh, you have to look for underlying causes. Um, and so categories include perineoplastic, autoimmune, toxic, infectious, and also idiopathic. And you would get the typical workup for something like this. And I really like this slide. Um, I, I got, well. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so it kind of, to break it down, um, so uh, say a person comes in with something that looks like uh, sensory neuronopathy, um, mostly sensory changes, severe ataxia, um, and you get an EMG nerve conduction study that doesn't show any EMG changes, but just a sensory um, deficits in the nerve conduction study. We would get, um, you would look for any drug exposures, uh, specifically platinums or immune checkpoint inhibitor. You would also get some labs, like we talked about before, um, to look for any malignancy or underlying infectious causes. Um, sometimes you can actually have a seronegative Shrogan's, and so in that case, you would also consider a lip biopsy as well. Um, if everything else comes back negative, you would look for other uh, causes of ataxic neuronopathy by getting a spine MRI, lumbar puncture, looking at CSF studies. And so for this patient um, who had sensory neuronopathy, um, usually these patients come in with profound sensory ataxia with multifocal or generalized sensory deficits. Sometimes they can appear weak on your physical exam, but it could be also secondary to sensory issues. And so it's important to look for other underlying causes as well. All right, thank you. That's great, Megan, that was quick. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to tell a fable about Lisa. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I think it's mostly true, but I don't know if it's all true. I mean, you all know, you know, Lisa is a professor. She uh, pretty much started the field of peripheral nerve ultrasound. And uh, it's a story of mentoring and, and good mentoring. So Lisa came from uh, Wake Forest to be a neuromuscular fellow here. Uh, when uh, Don and Janice were still, you know, very active. And um, I don't think Lisa had a plan to go into academics at that point, but um, Don and Janice had asked her what she was interested in. And I, th I think because she was from Wake Forest, ultrasound popped up because Wake Forest was one of the beginnings, what was the name, Tool, Dr. Tool was doing the carotid. All yeah, so ul ultrasound was a big thing. And Lisa said, well, maybe I'd like to take a crack at ultrasounding peripheral nerves. So the famous story is on a Saturday, Don and uh, Janice in the front seat and Lisa in the back seat drove to Charlotte to a, uh, a secondhand medical supply store uh, and bought a used ultrasound machine and brought it back. And that started Lisa's career. And, and luckily for us, that happened and she's still here. And uh, she still is, you know, one of the founding leaders of the field of peripheral nerve ultrasound. She's also a phenomenal doctor and a great teacher. And we're very lucky to have Lisa today. And you can correct any part of what I just said. Um, I'm not sure it was a Saturday, but yeah, the rest. It has the, a flavor. Yeah, the rest is, is true. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity and uh, the fact that they, I uh, had that faith in me. So I'm going to share a screen here. And then, uh, yeah, trying to, yeah, we're good. 
Okay, so today I'm going to talk about neuromuscular ultrasound and clinical practice and research. And I know that a lot of people are probably unfamiliar with this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of how ultrasound developed, uh, what we can do with ultrasound today, really focusing on the story as it's developed in CIDP, which is an acquired autoimmune polyradicular neuropathy. And throughout this, you'll hear about some of the limitations of what we have now. I'll talk about research we're doing here at Duke and kind of the direction for the future. Uh, you may have heard a lot about compression neuropathies like carpal tunnel syndrome and ulnar neuropathy at the elbow with ultrasound. We're not going to talk a lot about that today other than to use it to illustrate a case. So where were we before 2005 with neuromuscular medicine in our EMG lab? Well, a standard case is a uh, middle-aged person will come into our lab with numbness and tingling in their first three digits. And, you know, they shake their hand or relieve the numbness and tingling. It might wake them up at night. We find signs on examination that are consistent with the median neuropathy at the wrist. And we do nerve conductions and EMG. And yeah, it looks like that neuropathy localizes to about the wrist. So we try conservative treatment. We try wrist splinting. That doesn't help but steroid injections of the carpal tunnel may have. So the patient undergoes carpal tunnel release, they get no improvement. So what do you do then? This is pre-2005. Do they get exploratory surgery? Do you just treat their symptoms or do you do nothing at all? And it's into that void is where ultrasound steps to give us the additional information we need to really treat our patients. So where did this all start? Ultrasound is really not a new technology. It's really old. Uh, the first mention of it was back in 1793 by Lazzaro Spallazzani, who proposed echolocation as a means by which bats navigated in the dark. Flash forward a century later, and the first ultrasound was developed. Ultrasound just refers to sound waves above the frequency of human hearing, but sometimes animals can still hear that. Hence the development of the Galton whistle, which people know by a slightly different name uh, today. And around the same time, though, a lot of other advances were being made. These two guys in the back, Jacques and Pierre Curie, uh, discovered the piezoelectric effect back in 1880. And this is the effect by which mechanical stress on certain types of materials like ceramics and crystals produces an electrical current. That's exactly how our ultrasound transducers work today and enable us to image things. And it's also uh, the reason behind these earthquake lights that were recently reported like in Morocco where they had the big earthquake. Now, Pierre Curie married a slightly famous person named Marie and they got a Nobel prize, but also their daughter got a Nobel prize in chemistry a couple of decades later. Just wanted to point that out. But ultrasound really had its first application with sonar during World War I, and that was a collaboration between international scientists and militaries, and they would use sound waves to locate submarines. But it wasn't until after World War II that we really began to see medical applications for ultrasound, and that was from Dr. Theodore Dusik, who first imaged the cerebral ventricles. Now, granted, this was a terrible process for patients to go through. You had to duck your head backwards into a water bath. This is from the University of Cincinnati, by the way. And you can see the cerebral ventricles being displayed over there. So actually, this start is kind of amazing. Anyone did anything with the technology, but people kept pushing along. And this was the first echocardiogram uh, that was ever performed. And you can see it looks nothing like a heart. That's because it's M mode or motion mode is only showing movement of components of the heart, not B mode or brightness mode, which gives us the anatomical images we see today. And this was developed by uh, Professor Helmuth Hertz, whose uncle coined the measure of frequency known as Hertz. So a lot of uh, families involved in developing this technology. But over the decades, the resolution of ultrasound got much better and brightness mode was developed the higher the frequency of the transducer that was used, the better spatial resolution we could get of anatomical structures. 
So before long, we're imaging, you know, gallbladders, carotid arteries, and then eventually nerves with the first publication on this being in 1985. Now, granted, it's hard to believe there's much of a nerve in there, but it's the recurrent laryngeal nerve underneath the thyroid and over the longest coli muscle. But despite this unimpressive start, things moved along uh, very quickly. And now you can see here from our own lab using a 15 megahertz transduce transducer, which is pretty standard. This is a cross section of the peroneal or fibular nerve at the fibular head. And you can make out the individual fascicles within a nerve. In the image nerve, we're usually using a transducer that's at 12 megahertz of frequency or above. These ultrasounds are now integrated with a lot of nerve conduction and EMG systems. There's also portable versions, and I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide. And we even have these ultra high frequency ultrasound transducers that will image up to 70 megahertz. And at that level, you can count the individual fascicles of the nerve, and you can just see an amazing degree of detail. So as I mentioned, systems can be really portable these days. You can see that this particular system actually plugs into a smartphone or tablet, you can take it with you anywhere. So this is a technology we're really making a lot of use of in neuromuscular medicine. But in standard application in our EMG lab, we use this on every compression neuropathy, a lot of polyneuropathies, particularly those that are acquired or autoimmune. And we'll talk about that with our CIDP example. We use it for nerve traumas because we're able to really well delineate continuity or transection of nerves and guide our surgeons as to what needs to be done to perhaps repair the nerve. We can use it to assess the muscle for different myopathies. Uh, we can detect fasciculations with improved sensitivity in ALS, but also monitor changes in the muscle itself and even reduction in the size of the nerve. And it's very helpful in a lot of instances for pre-surgical planning, whether or not that's a nerve repair or a nerve biopsy. So to illustrate how we've been able to develop this over the last 15 years, I'm going to focus on CIDP, but to understand what we're talking about, just a few B-mode basics, nerves enlarge when they get inflamed or compressed, when they become darker as when they become edematous, we call that hypoechoic, bright, which can be associated with fibrosis is hyperechoic. They can change shape like with a tumor or compression. And when they have increased intraneural blood flow, that can be a sign of inflammation and axonal degeneration. With muscle, with chronic disease, you get increased fat and fibrosis, which makes them brighter. And in an acute stage, if there's edema or perhaps a hematoma, you're going to see a darker signal. And of course, muscle can change in thickness and shape depending upon what's happening. So... Let's take a look at where we are now with that same case that came in 20 years ago. Still the same presentation, but this time, before this patient ever gets treatment, the same day that she gets the nerve conduction study and the EMG study, we perform a nerve ultrasound there in the lab, right at the point of care. And we see an atypical enlargement of the nerve near the wrist. It's not at the carpal tunnel itself. And we're concerned that this is a nerve tumor. So we order an MRI of contrast focusing on that nerve and refer to neurosurgery, perhaps for biopsy and potential resection. So you can already see even in what I call the basic state we're in now, this really changes management and care of the patient and can prevent unnecessary procedures and delays in treatment. So let's talk about nerve imaging and CIDP and how that's developed over the last two decades. Well, CIDP is diagnosed characteristically by the <clears throat> clinical picture and nerve conduction studies, but it really doesn't fulfill those electrodiagnostic criteria in about a quarter of cases. We've known for years that when we're slow to diagnose and slow to treat, that patients don't do well. Permanent axonal loss occurs, and we just don't have good outcomes. We also know that on MRI, where it was first seen, that nerves get big in CIDP from the demyelination and remyelination process, which can create the onion bulbs that you perhaps have seen in histology lab or in textbooks. 
So we're able with ultrasound to look at three different things with nerves and CIDP that inform us about diagnosis, but also prognosis. And it can help us guide our treatment decision-making. So the three main things we can currently assess, current state, no research involved, are nerve size, the patterns of nerve enlargement, and the signal of the nerve, that is how dark or bright it is, the echogenicity. And this is so well developed that with the most recent revision of the CIDP diagnostic guidelines from the European Academy of Neurology and Peripheral Nerve Society, finding nerve enlargement at two sites in proximal median nerve segments, like the forearm or above the elbow, or finding nerve enlargement in the brachial plexus is considered a supportive diagnostic criteria. So imaging is now part of that diagnostic algorithm. So why not MRI? That's always the question I get because MRI creates a better picture. It looks more like the anatomical images we see in textbooks. Well, ultrasound has several distinct advantages. Number one, it can visualize nerves and muscles in motion, and it has multiplanar imaging capability. Peripheral nerve does not travel in a set sagittal, coronal, or axial view. It wraps around nerves, it dives superficial, it dives from a low position in the forearm, perhaps to a superficial location. And by tilting your transducer, you can get the nerve throughout its course. You miss parts of it, small segments with the MRI planes. It's also a really high speed exam and only takes a few minutes to scan the whole nerve, say from wrist to axilla. You can do it in the clinic or in the EMG lab, and it's very inexpensive. But what people don't realize is it actually has higher point-to-point -point spatial resolution than a three Tesla MRI, which is kind of the standard. This is a longitudinal section of a digital branch of the median nerve to your index finger. You can see the bright signal here is the epineurial borders. You can see the nerve in between. So we can get a lot of up close detail on these nerves. And when you compare how ultrasound performs head to head, with MRI, you can see that it's essentially equal to better. Um, the disadvantage that uh, ultrasound has is we don't have a contrast agent or a reliable measure of signal intensity, but you can see that for nerve traumas and tumors and other conditions, ultrasound actually outperforms MRI looking at nerve continuity. Uh, it performs just as well in detecting fascicular change, better at detecting change in size of nerves, and equally well in detecting neuromas or mass lesions. So it is a really good choice that we should uh, utilize more often. So what do we see in CIDP? Well, nerve size is where we're gonna start. And the first publication on this that was systematic is now almost 15 years old. And it examined 36 patients with CIDP looking only at the median and ulnar nerves because that's all we could reliably measure at that point. All of these patients had known CIDP. And what they found was that in CIDP, nerves were over twice as large in patients as in controls. And they found correlations that were moderate between the duration of disease and nerve area. So the longer the disease had been going on, the bigger the nerve was the implication. And they also found that the larger the nerve was, the slower the conduction velocity. So some promise there. And people kept mining this over the next five to six years. You can see some examples here from our own lab. This is a median nerve in a patient with CIDP in the forearm near the brachial artery. These are individual fascicles that you can see that are quite enlarged. The bright material is connective tissue and myelin. This nerve is 77 millimeters square. That's about 10 times the upper limit of normal that we would expect. And in the same patient, the ulnar nerve is even more affected. The ulnar nerve is normally smaller than the median nerve. So this is 85 millimeters squared, about 12 times the upper limit of normal. And again, you can see these individual fascicles that are quite large in this mix of dark and bright elements. So remember this image as we go along. And again, by 2015, not much had changed. People were publishing study after study showing that nerves were big in CIDP and there were correlations with conduction velocity and even sites of conduction block. So it seems like it was going to be very helpful, but how? Well, 
By 2021, a variety of ultrasound scoring systems had been developed for CIDP. Most of these were developed in Europe uh, by Antonius Karasnudis and Alexander Grimm. You can see some examples listed here. Probably the most common that's used is the ultrasound pattern sum score. And what all of these scoring systems do is they advise you to scan nerves at predetermined sites and assign a value to them as either small, um, normal sized, or too large. And you also comment upon if that enlargement is diffuse or multifocal. And with this, they're able to establish cutoff scores that are helpful in the diagnosis of conditions like Guillain-Barre syndrome, CIDP, and multifocal motor neuropathy. It's beyond the limits or probably interest of this talk to talk about any of them in detail, but just a slide to show they are helpful. The study is out of the Green Journal in Neurology, and it took 100 patients who were coming to a laboratory in the Netherlands to be examined for different types of inflammatory neuropathy. This included Lewis Sumner syndrome, which is a variant of CIDP, and also multifocal motor neuropathy. All the patients underwent ultrasound and electrodiagnostic studies, and they found in about three quarters of patients, they had abnormalities in both forms of testing. But in about a fifth of patients, only the ultrasound was abnormal in a way that indicated an inflammatory neuropathy. So you can see how this is additive, complementary to the work that we already do. When we move from these standard frequency probes to the ultra high frequency probes I had mentioned earlier, as I mentioned, you can see the fascicles of the nerve in great detail. And what we're beginning to see is that in very early CIDP and Guillain-Barre syndrome, you can detect single nerve fascicle enlargement before the entire nerve begins to enlarge. So this gives us even earlier diagnostic information. And one study has looked at this in detail, imaging 11 patients with CIDP and looking at them with a regular high frequency probe and the ultra high frequency probe. They found that the overall nerve area measured by either one of those did not differ, which is not surprising, but the ultra high resolution probe performed better at detecting the single fascicles. We're not gonna worry about these classes up top right now, because we're getting ready to talk about that in more detail. But you can see with these ultra high frequency probes, the darker column, you can actually count the individual fascicles and measure them reliably. So again, showing that we can improve our diagnostic capabilities through point of care imaging. The next question people have beyond diagnosis is, can nerve size tell us about prognosis in CIDP? A lot of retrospective studies said it might be useful, but a fairly large prospective study found otherwise. They found that nerve size itself had no correlation with clinical outcomes, and there was really no change in nerve size over the course of a year, presumably because the structural changes had already occurred and didn't represent edema alone. So if size alone is not providing us with enough information, what alternatives do we have? Well, this is where the patterns of involvement come in in nerve echo intensity. We know that with acquired inflammatory neuropathies, the nerve gets multifocal enlargement. This is different than the standard nerve where say from wrist to axilla, there's very little change in nerve size. And even if you take a condition like CMT1A, where the nerves get really big, it's a uniform enlargement. But with inflammatory neuropathies, it's much like your angiography and vasculitis. It's kind of a beads on a string appearance. Uh, multifocal enlargement is what you're looking for. So studies began to try to look at nerve size variability as a measure of abnormality. And they found that most people have very little variability, that that range is less than 1.5 from the largest to the smallest point in the nerve over its course. And anything to or above was really too large. And this was more prominent in CIDP and multifocal motor neuropathy than any other neuropathy that was examined. But as they were doing this, they came up with information that was more important they established different patterns of nerve signal and size that they were seeing. The study from about a decade ago by the group in Rome 
uh, looked at over 30 patients with CIDP and measured a variety of nerves along with the brachial plexus and cervical nerve roots. And what emerged were three patterns of involvement. First, a very diffuse swelling of the nerve where the nerves became very dark and hypoechoic. Second, big nerves that had a mix of bright and dark signal, like the images I showed you earlier from our own lab. And then class three, where the nerves were normal size and they were kind of bright in some cases to just kind of bland and signal. And while this study confirmed what we already knew about nerve size and nerve size variability, the big thing that came out of it was that patterns of involvement give you more information about where the patient is and their disease. Type one patterns are typically seen early in disease, while type three was seen in patients with longstanding, chronic, and active disease. So by looking at these patterns, you might be able to pick who's going to be more likely to respond to treatment. Other laboratories have replicated these findings, finding the largest nerves in moderately affected individuals and that the nerves get smaller with very chronic inactive disease, which moves us into the topic of nerve echo intensity. So looking at these patterns, people began to group patients into those three classes and try to look at prognosis prospectively. In over 12 months, what was typically seen was that patients in this class one with the darkest nerves were more likely to improve than the other two groups. About three quarters improved over 12 months compared to less than half in the other groups, despite the same standard of care treatment. Work on this continued onward and became more quantitative, not just qualitative, saying the nerve looks darker. In this study, again, focusing only on CIDP, they imaged patients and did nerve conduction studies every six months for up to three months. And they looked at the nerve systematically to examine what's called the fraction of black within the nerve. Uh, this is a median nerve and cross section in the forearm. And they applied different program uh, software to it to determine what percent was dark. In this healthy nerve, that was about 33%. So with this, they were able to divide patients into stable and progressive groups. Patients with stable CIDP more frequently had dark nerves at baseline than did those with progressive disease where the nerve was really bright. And this change persisted throughout the course of disease. So although the nerve echo intensity didn't seem helpful for monitoring how people were doing longitudinally, it certainly helped with prognosis. And again, other laboratories have shown the same thing. You can see that stable CIDP patients and healthy controls have about the same nerve signal, whereas those with progressive uh, CIDP have a lower fraction of black and a brighter uh, appearing nerve. So that's where we are, and it's not enough. We can't just rely on what we see with B-mode ultrasound. So we need to look toward other technologies. And I'm going to talk about three of those options, shear wave elastography, photoacoustic imaging, and how artificial intelligence can aid in everything that we'll talk about today. The first of these shear wave elastography is a particular research interest of mine. Uh, elastography, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is simply an acoustic palpation where you're able to assess the stiffness of tissues. So it's able to provide us information about the internal architecture and what's going on with the nerve, muscle, or really any tissue in the body. Any form of elastography involves application of an external force to the tissue that can be either mechanical, like with the older forms of strain elastography, where you simply press the transducer down, or ARFI imaging, which is acoustic radiation force impulse imaging, which sends a sound wave into a region of interest. The older forms, again, are measuring the relative stiffness of the tissue by how much it displaces in response to this external force. But shear wave is a bit different. What happens with shear wave is you select a region of interest in a tissue within a nerve, within a muscle, and you direct a really brief high intensity burst of sound wave into that region. And instead of looking to see how much the nerve or muscle moves, you're looking at the shear wave that propagates at a 90 degree angle 
to the incident sound. And then you track that shear wave and measure it at points that are only a couple hundred microns apart, which enables you to calculate a velocity in meters per second. You can also use a, a formula called Young's modulus to track it in kilopascals. But regardless, higher shear wave velocity or higher kilopascal measurements equal stiffer tissue. This wave is from within the median nerve in the forearm that we recorded here. And you can see that the shear wave is fastest, closest to the angle of incination there, the point of impact, and that it dissipates over a couple of uh, millimeters and gets slower. And even the dispersion and attenuation of this wave can give us information about the presence or absence of inflammation or fibrosis, as has been proven in liver and other tissue. So when we look at nerve uh, with shear wave, we, there's been a big focus on carpal tunnel syndrome and ulnar neuropathy, and they keep finding that the nerves are stiffer. Uh, why? Uh, from animal models, we can assume that it's from edema early in disease and fibrosis later on. But today I want to focus on muscle, which is where I'm doing most of my funded work right now. These are shear wave images of healthy muscle. You can see that healthy muscle is not very stiff in comparison to other tissues. It's going to have a low velocity and it's pretty homogenous here. So people are already using shear wave imaging to look at different conditions, muscular dystrophies, but also inflammatory myopathies. I'm gonna give a couple examples of these and then talk about the work we do here. In the first study published on this, over 20 patients diagnosed with inflammatory myositis were included. I wouldn't have included the IBM patient because I consider that to be something different, but at least they weren't on treatment. And they also used the term polymyositis in the study, which has of course fallen out of favor. But regardless, they imaged these patients and age match healthy controls with shear wave and MRI. And what they found, you can see in red that myositis patients had less stiff muscle than did healthy controls. Now this didn't correlate with CK levels, the degree of fat seen on the MRI or disease duration, but it did correlate with strength, function, and best correlated with muscle edema. Using this imaging, the shear wave alone, they could differentiate healthy controls from those with myositis in 92% of patients. Other studies have come with some different findings. And I point this one out because unlike the prior study, these patients were untreated. And the interesting finding on this study was that they found increased stiffness of the muscle, not reduced, but due to these islands of stiffness that were found on the shear wave image. You can see this is about at 6.5 meters per second. And these islands correlated with, in, with areas of stir abnormality on MRI. So showing uh, the promise that shear wave could perhaps guide biopsy sites but also provide us with areas we could track to see if patients were responding to clinical intervention and treatment. There has been one longitudinal study on this type of patient with myositis, and they divided the patients in the study into those who got their first ultrasound image at less than three months from diagnosis and those at greater than three months. And they were imaging both the vastus lateralis and deltoid. And about half the patients were able to get in that less than three month group. And what they found was that echogenicity measured qualitatively trended toward normal in the thigh, but that shear wave went from being less stiff than what was normally seen toward normal uh, in the patients who were imaged early in disease. A trend toward this was also seen in the deltoid. So this tells us, first of all, it's important to get early baseline images that shows the promise of shear wave and being a longitudinal outcome marker that we can use in research and in the clinic. But despite this uh, progress, there are issues that we need to overcome. Uh, first of all, muscle is readily compressible with your transducer. So you gotta control for that because it can affect results. We also know that deeper in the tissue, our results are less accurate, perhaps even within the same muscle. 
how you hold the transducer affects what's called the angle of insonation, which can change your results by a factor of four. You have to control for patient positioning, the type of system used, the system settings, and many different things. Even within one laboratory, practice and standardization of how these images are collected can improve what we're doing. In this study by Romano, you can see when they initially tried shear wave velocity measurements of muscle, they were getting really high values that were in the range of abnormal with a lot of variability. As they standardized their protocol, the shear wave values dropped toward normal and they were able to reduce the variance between examiners and between different visit days. And that's what we're working to overcome here at Duke. I have some funding and a longstanding collaboration with Kathy Nightingale's lab on biomedical engineering. And we've been working on creating a 3D muscle acquisition protocol to eliminate the issues of variable compression, angle of insonation, positioning, all the different things that are mentioned here. And importantly, we've designed a separate muscle algorithm protocol for scanning. If you buy a commercial system and press a button for shear wave, you're getting uh, processing that was designed for tissues without boundaries and fascial planes in them, like liver, breast, thyroid, that type of tissue. Already, you can see that when we image a muscle either along or across, even on different days with repositioning of the patient, we're getting very reproducible results. We're able to do this because this transducer contains different imaging components that enable us to image in a sphere. This is a 2D representation, but this is always rotating and creating different uh, shear wave measurements that you can see by the yellow line there. And it's been a long road there. First of all, we're starting with a little robotic arm in a water bath to help with the signal. Then we're fixing people in place with this biodex system. And now as of this year, we're using um, this robot arm, which is oh, shrunk since the last time uh, we, I did a video. But what you can see here is this standardizes the degree of compression, the angle of insonation, the rotation speed and everything that we're doing. And the pilot data that we got out of this is that with this, we can really outperform the traditional 2D imaging, even on different days, different examiners, different patients. When we image the standard way along the muscle, we're only getting about 5% variability in our results compared to much higher with the old methods. Right now we're imaging patients with nerve and muscle disease to characterize the differences in those groups and correlations with how they're doing clinically as well. So with that, I'm gonna move on the last few minutes to photoacoustic imaging and AI. And I'm really excited about photoacoustic imaging. So I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it, but what you do with photoacoustic imaging is you're comparing an ultrasound system with an optic system and you direct a non-ionizing laser at a region of interest that causes thermoelastic expansion. It creates sound waves that go back to a receiver. The two modalities come together and give you an image. The first publications on this came in 2016 to examine the role in early nerve injury in animal models. So prior to that, we really couldn't do this with nerve. It didn't have a high enough absorption coefficient but when you inject gold nanoparticles and conjugate them with substances native to the nerve, you can get images that we can see. And the substance they chose was heat shock protein 27, which upregulates early in nerve injury. And they conjugated that with the gold nanorods and they tested it on uh, rats that underwent sciatic nerve crush injury. They knew that HSP27 was upregulated in all these animals with injury because they proved it by electron microscopy. But what they were able to see, and this will come out a little more clearly on the next slide, is that if you just injected the gold nanorods in rats with injured nerves, you didn't see much. A normal nerve, even with the conjugated antibody, nothing. But with the injured nerve and these conjugated antibodies, you started to see signal. And this is where you could see it becoming kind of a contrast agent for ultrasound uh, like MRI has. It could detect early injury, 
perhaps monitor inflammation, track nerve regeneration in response to treatment. But what's the holdup on it? Well, the equipment's really expensive, not commercially available. And if you use the method described there, you can only see 100 micrometers in depth. It is not helpful because your median nerve is seven to 10 millimeters deep, even in a slender individual at the wrist. But people have already overcome a lot of these issues. Uh, just by shining light on your skin, you can get from 100 micrometers to two millimeters of depth. With an optical fiber, you can see pretty much what you want to within the forearm or leg in a human. Different forms of this are being developed that look more like CT and give you some volumetric imaging. I won't go into the different types for this lecture, but here we are six years after that initial publication, and you can see how far things have come. They used an IgG4 monoclonal antibody here. This is a mouse ear in vivo. They didn't have to dissect the mouse or uh, take a biopsy. And for three hours, they were able to uh, visualize the sweat glands and small peripheral nerves within the skin. So a remarkable development. And even further than this, with the CT type modality that I described, you can actually get wonderful images that even track cells moving through the vasculature. This is an example of looking at melanoma cells going through the brain of a mouse. So a really a lot of potential here for something that you could do in a clinical setting. And lastly, how does AI tie all this together? Well, obviously it's really in the news everywhere right now. The term of course encompasses deep learning and machine learning. And obviously AI can help us in imaging because there's a lot of diagnostic errors that people make in viewing images up to 10 to 15% of the time. But AI can do so much more than that. Things that it would translate to a neuromuscular ultrasound, a lot of them are already in progress. For example, providing instructions for optimizing the scan in real time, creating protocol-based scanning, automatically adjusting your image uh, so that you get the best one possible, doing compounding and 3D, building databases for reference values for nerve and muscle, and even differentiating healthy from disease muscle and nerve. It also is able to distract, extract um, data from an image that we can't see with the naked eye. I'll give one example of how this is already being used in nerve and another in muscle. So this first one's for cubital tunnel syndrome, which is ulnar nerve compression near the elbow. And they took 30 healthy nerves in 30 patients with electrodiagnostically confirmed ulnar neuropathy. And they didn't look at nerve size at all. What they did was they took a video of the ulnar nerve in each patient and extracted 100 images from that, did the same thing with controls, and fed it into the system and did something called occlusion sensitivity analysis, which essentially looked at characteristics within the interior of the nerve to see what differentiated healthy from unhealthy nerve. And what they found is using these three different protocols, they were able to accurately identify ulnar neuropathy nerves in about 90% of the cases, 90% of the images. So this is something that I think will be coming to our commercial systems as time goes on. We can also do the same thing for muscle. Uh, in this study, which seems small on the surface, but really is the basis for everything we're going to do, they took a database of nearly 4,000 images that have been labeled normal or abnormal muscle by expert neuromuscular sonographers and applied deep learning methodology. And what they tried to determine was could AI identify the whole extent of the muscle? Because that's important. If you're asking a uh, you know, computer program to say is a muscle abnormal or normal, you gotta make sure it can identify the muscle first. And what you can see here is that in most cases, the expert and the computer model, they agree, they overlap. In some case, the automatic algorithm went kind of nuts here. It started picking up things that were not muscle at all. Yet in other cases, it outperformed the human indicated here by green. But overall, it was able to identify the extent of the muscle 95 to 90 to 95 percent of the time, regardless if it was healthy or disease. So this is a huge first step in seeing how we'll use this uh, in the clinic and in research studies in the future.
So wrapping things up, where will we be in 2030? Well, going back to that same case I presented, we're still going to do the ultrasound on the patient and maybe the device will be a little more portable and we're suspicious for a nerve tumor. But now this ultrasound system has AI in it and suggests other studies. It runs a shear wave algorithm and also maybe a photoacoustic imaging protocol. And at the end of that clinic visit with only five to 10 minutes of extra time, you determine that the patient actually has a schwannoma of their median nerve and you refer them to neurosurgery for appropriate management. You've improved the diagnostic process and avoid delays in care. So that's all I have today. I hope uh, you're a little bit excited about where neuromuscular ultrasound is today and the potential for research going forward. Thank you. So what about picking a spot for a biopsy muscle? Uh, yeah, we did a study for that a few years back, and it can be really helpful because you don't want to biopsy an area that is unaffected or too affected. If the area is totally fibrotic, you're not going to get diagnostic information. So yeah, it can definitely be helpful for that purpose, just as MRI of muscle can as well. Questions? Anything in the chat? There's a lot in the chat. I think. You have 10 messages, probably a lot of them a lot about. Of job. Yeah, in code. I don't see any questions in the chat. She got two Nobel Prizes, Dr. Roger. I, I'm sorry, he is correct, I believe. Um, all right. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. It certainly changed a lot in the 10 years I've been away. When I left the neuromuscular field to come here, there was no ultrasound. And now it sounds like it's, do you get reimbursed for it, by the way? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a value added thing because we do get a lot of referrals to our EMG lab because we do ultrasound and perhaps other locations don't. So is that technique with the giant arm? That, I mean, that's not usable in clinical work, is it? Uh, where it's research basis only now, but we bring it over to the EMG lab and image patients over there that enroll in the study, yeah. Have any of those uh, contrast agents you've talked about been approved to inject into people yet? Not yet. Not yet. No. Not yet. There awesome. are some contrast agents approved in Europe for like echocardiography, but they don't work great for nerve. Again, thank you very much, Lisa. Great okay. work. Great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everyone, for coming.